Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. Today we are in 2 Peter chapter 2. This is a very interesting chapter, and we'll get into it, but before we do that, please, if you're on YouTube or if you're on Transistor, Apple, Stitcher, Google, Spotify, wherever you may be, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast, share it with your friends, even if you don't share the link, share the information, share the living words of God that you hear, and if you can, go to patreon.com slash tawahado and try to contribute or donate. So we're going to see it a little bit into the chapter, but this is one of those pieces of scripture that doesn't make it, as I mentioned when I introed. And Second Peter chapter 2 really highlights what's going on. So we'll begin with verses 1 to 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. They will even deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways, and because of these teachers, because of them, the way of truth will be maligned, and in their greed they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced against them long ago has not been idle, and their destruction is not asleep. We see the prophet and we see the teacher. There are slight nuances, but for all intents and purposes, the same function is being had. Someone stands up before the community of people dedicated to the literacy or the literal, um, the literary beauty of the Older Testament and the Newer Testament, and someone is representing God in explaining the teaching using examples in order to build up that community and to edify them by making them not so insular, but having them look outside. And sometimes, you know, the prophet is kind of stereotyped about just talking about the future, but all the time, the prophet is a teacher. So there are many similarities there. Licentious is used here. Licentiousness is the idea of promiscuity, uh, being a loose woman, they said in a play that I read in middle school, euphemistically. So licentiousness is not just about sexual immorality, but it's also about following the teachings of other gods. So if we are disobedient to the living God of scripture and become obedient to the gods and goddesses trying to compete with God, then we have a spirit of licentiousness. We are cheating on our Lord and our Savior. Greed is showing up here as one of the reasons, a quick buck people try to make, right? It's the folks of the prosperity gospel. One of my Sunday school students, he <laughs> always cracks me up. He's like, I'm always here when, um, I'm always here for it whenever you're giving smoke out to the prosperity gospel people. For those of you who don't know what that means, it means, uh, you know, shooting shots, right? Putting putting down the false teachers. And I'll have you know, it's not something that I do just because I take delight in it, but because it is a biblical thing to do. And good teachers, true teachers, are hard to come by. Two of my teachers, Dr. Richard Benton and Father Mark Bulos, have asked me to work on a project and along with a motley crew of some women, a homeschooling mom, a police officer, and some black American deacons, both Eastern Rite Catholic as well as Greek Orthodox, I will be speaking on the issue of race insofar as there is an intersection between that topic and the epistle to the Galatians from the Apostle Paul. We'll begin around July 18th of this year, so a couple weeks from now, and we'll go to the end of August. I personally 
will be most involved as a presenter doing Galatians chapter 4, but hopefully I'll be able to participate every Saturday morning along with everybody else to hear the text of Galatians again and again and again. Verses 4 to 10. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, even though he saved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood on a world of the ungodly, and if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, and made them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the lawless, for that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul, his breath of life, by their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. And to them, the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge their flesh in depraved lust and who despise authority. For those of you who don't know, uh, I actually didn't mention it, so I'm in the NRSV today, the new revised standard version. And uh, I pause at some moments because they have a lot of these like footnotes and alternative translations, and this text says it this way. I said Tartarus instead of hell, because they gave the option for hell or Tartarus. And hell is typically the Greek word Gehenna, it's kind of a technical point, but you have Tartarus, Hades, and Gehenna. And sometimes all of these words could be hell, but they're not all the same thing. Hades is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol, and it's the closest thing to it. You know, it's going to be from Greek, so probably from the Greek mythology or the Greek pantheon. And Hades is the place of the dead. Tartarus is supposed to be one of the sections of the places of the dead. Gehenna which is really the only word I like translating as hell, is specifically this grounded reality of a fire bin of trash that they use as an analogy for the lake of fire that is prepared for Satan and for his messengers or his angels on the final day after judgment. And we hear a lot about final judgment, which is forthcoming, which is in the future. We don't know exactly when, but we see the sign of the times and we say, hey, Maybe this is how it's going to be ushered in with Kanye West as king of America. Who knows? Any, anyway, you see sinning angels, right? Beings of light that can deceive you. This is reminiscent of Galatians, where Paul says, even if I were to come as an angel of light or as, or as one of the other apostles with a different gospel or a different good news, there is no other good news. So don't accept me. Let me be anathema. Let me be accursed. And he says it twice in Galatians, right? So here you have that, but you also have echoes of the Deuterocanon, the so-called Deuterocanon, the book of Enoch, Mazafahinoch, after which I was named. You have all these references from the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, and they are considered examples, parables, edifying stories, stories that are meant to build up your community, to protect your community. Verses 11 to 6. Oh, I skipped that last little line of 10. Bold and willful, they are not afraid to slander the glories or the glorious ones. These are, again, these, these celestial beings. So let's go to 11 to 16. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not bring against them a slanderous judgment from the Lord, these people, however, are like irrational animals, mere creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed. They slander what they do not understand, and when those creatures are destroyed, they also will be destroyed. Suffering the penalty for doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their dissipation. It also says an alternative here is love feasts. While they feast with you, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady breaths of life. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed, anathema, children. They have left the straight road and have gone astray. 
following the road of Balaam, son of Bosor, who loved the wages of doing wrong, but he was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. You have reveling here. There's one path, and reveling makes you stray from the path. The love feasts, the pagan love feasts, where there are orgies, sacrifices to idols, and I'm sure more practical promiscuity or looseness is called dissipation in the daytime. Does that mean don't go to those lovely Los Angeles day parties? Maybe, maybe not. But watch out and examine everything that you do. Christ is not to be compartmentalized to one time and one day. Sundays from 10 to 11, or if you're an Orthodox, especially if the good is right, maybe 6 a.m. to 11, or whatever your time slot is. God made every day. God deserves every time. Everything that we think, speak, and do should reflect God. We are his representatives and ambassadors, especially the more and more we flaunt and tell others that we are Orthodox Christians. So as his representatives, we need to make sure we're running a positive public relations or PR campaign and not a negative one for him. We are marketing on his behalf. Let's make sure we represent him properly, lest he fire us. Numbers 22, Balaam, uh, is the story of Balaam. You find it also in the epistle to Jude, probably we'll cover it again there. But the basic idea is this donkey, this jackass, is an example so that we can know God uses not only anyone at any time in any place, but any animal. He doesn't need a human being. He can use an animal to have speech. He can have a stone produce water. He can have heavens produce bread. He doesn't need a bakery because he has the heavens. He doesn't need rivers because he has stones. And he doesn't need human beings because he has the jackass to speak on his behalf. When the human being fails and is disobedient to God, the donkey will be obedient if God wants it to be. 17 to the end. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the deepest darkness has been reserved. For they speak bombastic nonsense and with licentious desires of the flesh, they entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For people are slaves to whatever masters them. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment that was passed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog turns back to its own vomit and the soul is washed only to wallow in the mud. Two very vivid examples or parables at the end. You may not be a so, you may not be a dog, but I know you don't want to be in your own vomit. I know you don't want to wallow in your own mud. So if you have begun the road to Christianity, don't you dare stop. If you've begun studying scripture, don't you dare stop. There is a day of judgment ahead, and we will be judged based on what we heard. So you are being exhorted by the living God of Scripture to keep going. Keep going. Freedom is not about laying down on your couch, sipping a beer. It could be about that, but it's not. Freedom is counterintuitively the discipline that it takes to be obedient to God and to continually do his will, not even out of fear of judgment, but so that you can please him today and forevermore.